super excited for the topic today. Um, we're going to be talking about direct mail. So our goal is for you to leave uh, the webinar today with some strategies and examples of things that you can do either on your SDR team, if you're full cycle sales uh, rep that's doing prospecting or a sales leader. Uh, our goal is that you walk away with some really tangible just strategies and, and tactics that you can put into action. Um, before we dig in, I want to just kind of quickly introduce everyone here. Uh, we got Chris, who is CEO and co-founder at Sendoso. Uh, he's going to be sharing a lot of examples of what Sendoso customers are using. It's uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see what he's got. Uh, Jesse is director of sales at Owler, done a lot of work as an outside sales rep in New York City, which we're going to talk about, got a lot of really good stories, examples to share with us. And then Dale Dupree is founder and CSO at the uh, Sales Rebellion. We've done a couple of webinars together. Uh, Dale's superpower, I would say, is like creativity, super creative guy. So he's going to share some examples of stuff that we're doing as well. So let's dig in. Let me know in the chat. I think it'd be good to kind of pull the audience first. Uh, do you use direct mail? Ticket meetings or to land customers? Give us a yes or no in the chat. Do you use direct mail, gifting, any of that kind of stuff? There's a lot of yeses in here actually, way more than I thought. Yeah, I agree. Wow, very cool. Wow. Video mailers. Okay. Yeah. I like uh, the I like the right. smiley face. That's the best answer. Just the smiley <laughs> face. I thought that was the best one. <laughs> James says just booze count. Definitely counts. Yeah. Of course, James. Absolutely. Do you send yeah. it to yourself, James? Is that that's a real question? <laughs> <laughs> um, Chris, I want to go ahead and kick the first question your way. Um, I want to get into kind of some of the why components uh for someone that maybe hasn't tried this before. Um, when you think about like something you mentioned in our first conversation was this concept of like pattern disrupts and just doing something that's different. Do you want to kind of give some context into like what is so different about direct mail versus, you know, the common things that I might talk about making cold calls, sending cold emails, connecting with people on LinkedIn. How does direct mail act as a pattern interrupt and maybe kind of talk about what that is? Yeah. So I think that, you know, for the last decade, um, a lot of sellers have uh, really focused on cold calling, social and email. And I think that's because those have been the easier ones to to kind of automate or to do at scale. Um, and, you know, I'd say circa like Sendoso before we existed, you know, it uh, direct mail and gifting was a bit harder. A lot of there's manual effort. There's uh, uh, incremental costs, too, which makes it, you know, you could send out a thousand emails. And uh, maybe it costs you zero. If you send out a thousand bottles of uh, whiskey to the the booth, does the booze count question? You know that's going to cost you money. And so because of that, there's less of it happening, which means when you get hit with a direct mailer or a gift, uh, you're it's a little bit different than getting hit with ten emails. And so because of that, that pattern disrupt makes someone look twice. Uh, so I think that's the first thing. I think the other thing is. As humans, we're genuinely curious individuals. And when you see a box at your doorstep or an email with a link to, to claim a gift, you're kind of like, what is in, what's in the box? What is it? Um, I don't think that rule applies when you're like, ooh, what's this email? Like, what's this text going to be in this email? So I think, uh, again, there's a bit of curiosity in psychology. There's a bit of pattern disrupt. And then you mentioned this earlier, one of Dale's superpowers is creativity. I think salespeople have to have creativity as one of their soft skills in order to be successful in the next decade. Um, and that could relate to creativity in your cold calls, creativity in your, your emails, but creativity in direct mail is one thing that can definitely set you apart. And, uh, you know, there's infinite ways to be creative because it's what's the gift item? When are you sending it? What's the trigger on why to send it? What's the message in the box? What's the, so all of those different things lend itself well to creative individuals. Yeah. So an, an interesting stat that I saw in a report that you guys put together was that during the pandemic, webinars increased by over a thousand percent, marketing emails by 62% and sales calls by 28%. And it's like, basically when you're doing direct mail, you're choosing to not compete in the mm -hmm. red ocean. <laughs> you're, you're choosing yep. to do something that's in a channel where people have less distraction. Uh, Dale, I want to kick the next question your way, uh, just because Chris brought up creativity. Um, I think what people might be thinking if they're listening to this is, well, I'm not really that creative. 
You know, like, how do you think outside of the box is what people say? Like, how do you think about creativity? Because some of the stuff that you're going to show us today is very outside of the box. Like it's, it's, it's like very creative is, is, is how I would kind of label that. But how do you think about creativity? And if someone's listening and, and doesn't really think that they're creative, how can they flex that muscle? Uh, two things that we teach in the rebellion, right? Number one is that everybody has their own rebellion. So it might not be the same as yours. Yours might not be the same as one of your colleagues, but regardless, like there's a common thread around like, what are you rebelling against? And so and another piece of that that we teach is the creative side, the people that say they're not creative, guys and girls, you got to stop telling yourself that and speaking it out loud as if it's some kind of truth. That's bullshit. It's a lie that you're telling yourself. You're creating distance by doing that as well, too, between, between what actually is. We're all creative in our own way. Like maybe your dad taught you a magic trick when you were young and you're really good at it. I can't do that stuff, right? Maybe at some point you played music and you're very creative from a musical standpoint. You can pick up a guitar, you can sit down at a piano, you could sing a tune uh, and actually keep it on key. Unlike most people, creativity is more than just like this idea of, oh my God, what am I going to send my prospect? Should I wrap a bow around this thing? Like it's not that Creativity is internally, it's something that for you is unique that somebody else can't do. Jason, to me, like Jason's creativity is in the way that he is extraordinarily good at capturing people's attentions on a cold call. I typically have never received a cold call like Jason teaches people to do, right? But if I did, if I got a cold call from a, a, a Bayer, can I call him that? Like your, your, your squad, I call them Bayers. Is that like a Bieber thing, right? Like if a Bayer called me, I'd take an appointment with the way that Jason teaches people how to very fluently and creatively like uh, con construct a conversation that, that flows naturally and feels good. And so, so to me, like the creative element is often overlooked at its core of what it actually is to you and your own rebellion. Yeah. I love all that. I, I think that something really practical you could do is, you know, they call it user experience or product. Right. It's what pro like world class product people do is they put themselves in the shoes of the people that are using the product. And in a way, when you're prospecting or being prospected to that, there's a user, a typical user journey associated with that. And it's I get a cold email from someone I don't recognize. I see it in my inbox. I decide whether to open it. I decide whether to reply. Like there are these user journeys that are pretty common because the cool thing about sales is most people have been sold to. You know, so if you kind of think about what the user journey is for someone that would typically be on the receiving end of something, what is that experience like? And let me know if I'm kind of off in your thinking here, Dale. It's just like, how could you just literally just do something different than what is expected? But first, just actually kind of sit down and like, what is the expected thing that, that, a, that a typical sales rep would do that a prospect would experience? It's really good. Let me just say this to McKinsey Bishop. Mackenzie just put, I work in the higher education space, so I'm not sure direct mail would work. A creative person does not say that. A creative person instead, and someone choosing to be creative, Mackenzie, says, you know what? I'm going to send something. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I'm going to think about, well, what would, it, what would somebody in the higher education space expect if they did get something in the mail? How does it apply to the things I fix, the problems I solve? How can I tell a story? How can I give an experience? And I promise, I promise you, Mackenzie, whether it's teachers, whether it's deans, whether it's it's principals, whatever it is inside of the organization, they will get your mail. A hundred percent will get it. So don't count yourself out with that. But but like you were just saying, Jason, and, and like I'm expressing, it's it literally in some cases just the ability to to try and and like tell yourself, I'm gonna give it a shot ultimately. Yeah, and I think the point there too is that certain industries, there maybe is some nuances, like maybe sending a bottle of whiskey to a school teacher isn't allowed or isn't practical, but that's where you get creative. Maybe it's a handwritten note. Maybe it's a, a printout of something unique. Maybe it's a video mailer. So I think it's, again, not limiting yourself by, you know, the, there's only one play available and that's, you got to send booze or something. It's like, Hey, in this industry, maybe that's not allowed, but you could do these 20 other things. And that's, again, goes back to the pattern disrupt. I think it's also Chris, a bottle of booze to a teacher. Like, Hey, your students suck and stress you out. And here's like a handle of Jack Daniels. I don't know, man. That sounds like really fun to me. I just, I, I agree. Maybe the school is, maybe the school is a different example, but certainly like in government, uh, there, there are certain, uh, people selling into 
public, uh, you know, you, you're not supposed to receive certain uh, types of gifts, but in general, yeah, I agree. A teacher is probably the one that needs the boost the most. <laughs> Um, yes, it sounded like you had some thoughts there. Yeah, I, just, I mean, I, I actually used to work as an admissions director at a boarding school. So like selling the psychologist and therapist and things like that. And I think that on their end, it's just finding the ways to create effort, right? Like differentiating yourself from other people that are reaching out to the same exact contact. You know, why are you different? And I think even as, you know, Dale's mentioning, just taking a stab at it, getting into it is the first step to actually even start that process, right? So, yeah. Well, and to be fair too, uh, if because I work with clients that sell into education, you're not trying to get a hold of the teacher. You're trying to get in, in, a hold of the director of curriculum and instruction, the principal, the superintendent. Um, McKinsey, or it wasn't McKinsey, Melissa Godsey, she only shared it with hosts and panelists, but I'll read what she said. This is an idea for the, the teacher people out there. She said, former teacher here, any classroom supplies you send a teacher, they're going to remember you. That's a really good example of like something that you could send to a school. I probably wouldn't direct it to a teacher because you're probably trying to get a meeting with, again, someone up in the org or at the district level. But there's lots of ideas out here. Uh, Jesse, so you got your start. Well, I don't know if you got your start, actually, but you've spent a, a good amount of time doing outside sales in New York City. And like this mail dropping stuff off, the gifting, like that was a big part of it. Do you want to kind of Take us back to that time when you were first starting to do that. Did you have any fears or apprehensions about doing some of this stuff? I mean, absolutely. I, I was I was selling security systems to commercial businesses like art galleries in New York City. And so cold calling a business and asking them about how they secure their business was very colorful cold calls, if, uh, if you get what I'm saying. And so that was an area where definitely I had to go and find creative tactics, find creative ways to go meet them at locations. And so I did a lot of feet on the street, going to visit businesses. I remember walking into some larger commercial buildings in New York where they have all the security and people in the lobby. And so the ability to go and drop off a nice box of Mist Fields cookies to the people in the lobby so they remember your face and kind of warm up that ability to go revisit that building again was a huge component of it. But yeah, I mean, the, the fear of just not succeeding by not trying it, I would always just go for a visit and see if we could warm up the interaction. And then they remember you because who is bringing these people gifts? Who's sending gifts to, you know, heads of sales at companies in, in, the, in the day and world we're in now? So I think it's ways to differentiate yourself. And then you can come back to the yeah. office and work on the emails, calls, and everything else that will help to dig in a bit deeper. But at yeah. least they're going to remember you while you do that. Yeah. So I think this sets the stage pretty pretty well for kind of the, the stuff that you can do. And what I've been taking away so far is that, um, you know, if this might push you outside your comfort zone, which doesn't like those are usually the things that you should do, the stuff that you're uncomfortable doing. Um, the second thing you sort of alluded to this, Jesse, is that direct mail is a part of the strategy. You still want to utilize phone, email, all of the normal channels. This is not a fix all, cure all kind of recipe. And Chris has some good examples he's going to show us of that. Um, and then the third thing is uh, just kind of think of like outside the box of it. Just what is the typical user experience that your prospects have when people prospect to them? And how can we be just a little bit different? Um, so where I want to start here, Chris, there's a couple of, I think the first question someone might have is like targeting mm -hmm. and kind of like thinking about who to send the stuff to. So for example, what I might be thinking is if I'm reaching out to a sales team, do I send something to the entire sales team? Is it just the stakeholders I want to get a hold of? Like, how do you think about the who component of where to or who to send this stuff to. Yeah. So I think on the who side, you know, there's a, a mix of different things that you'd want to do similar to like how you're emailing and cold calling. It's, you know, who is the, who's, who's the buyer, but who is also a part of that buying committee, maybe the exec sponsor, who's an influencer that might be able to introduce you to someone else, who's a partner that might be able to get you in. And so I think in a lot of those scenarios, and like we talked about earlier, supplementing what used to be hundred percent cold calling and email and social with uh, a direct mail or gift in there can drive the response and conversion rates better. So um, we typically suggest that you think about the buying experience and the different touch points and where can you interject and where can you test? You know, it might be in some industries, it's good to send the exec sponsor something early on. It's in some industries and in some ICPs, it's better to send something else. And so I think just like salespeople should be scientists and testing things out, 
Um, you know, direct mail and gifting is not a silver bullet where you just close your eyes, send, and then you could just count meetings on your calendar. It's, you know, again, another channel that is, has been underutilized in, in recent years and uh, has the ability for you to drive more meetings or close, uh, accelerate deals faster. So one big logistics question, someone's already asked it, it looks yeah. like, uh, that was Anna. Um, so do I send these to the office? Do I send it to a home address? Yeah. You know, the first thing I thought of, but like someone sending to a home address is like the prospect moment or like, dude, how the hell did you get my home address? Yep. Is that creepy? Like what, what are kind of logistics around like where to send it to once you know who you're going to send it to? Yeah. So the where I think it's, it's nuanced now. I think in the, uh, for the last few years, everything, the game has changed pre COVID, you know, purely send to office. You kind of assumed everyone was working from office. There was, you know, a few percent of people working remote, but they probably had some tie to the office during COVID. Everyone, everything changed for the most part, uh, at least for most industries. And so, uh, for us, you know, we we released a feature where you could ask the, the recipient to confirm their address, and for the most part, that would confirm, be uh, not be saved in like a CRM, but be dis, uh, discarded afterwards, and then be shipped to their home address. Now we're seeing nuances where. Uh, you can get tactical. Maybe you go um, on, uh, you know, white pages or one of those search sites and find someone's home address and surprise it at their home. And I don't think that's as creepy as pre-COVID times because people just know people are working from home. And so you get a mailer to your home. And there's a lot of D to C and B to C brands that send you a ton of stuff to your house. So it's not like it's the first package you've ever gotten. Um, but getting back to people's offices, I think, is an, also an opportunity uh, because, you know, people are starting to trickle back into offices and maybe it's a little bit more extra work. Um, there is also the asking to a confirm address. And then uh, we're, we're working on some uh, some tech uh, that we can also help predict where that person is so that you can leverage our system instead of having to think about all those options. Because we'll use data in the background to say, ah, Jesse's working from home. Chris goes in the office, you know, kind of thing. Pretty cool. Yeah. So what I'm getting from that is that it's okay to send it to someone's home address, especially sure. if you can get get your hands on that for sure. Uh, Jesse, you have something unique that you guys do at Aller too, where uh, like once we figured out kind of who we want to reach out to, there's also tr different kind of trigger events that we can leverage. So just like when we're prospecting through the phone or email or through social, having a reason to reach out like the company's hiring salespeople or whatever it might be. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what you guys have seen to be effective from an approach standpoint of leveraging different kinds of triggers and how the folks watching can think about that as well? For sure. I mean, I think, you know, Chris is spot on, right? Finding the accounts, prioritizing which accounts you're going to target first, right? Then it's, what is my messaging going to look like? And I think news comes into that prioritization of the accounts as well, right? So things like the easy ones are going to be, hey, XYZ company just raised a round of capital, right? But even that in itself is been over exhausted. So it's finding a little bit of creative tactics in the sense of, have they formed any strategic partnerships, right? Are you tracking some of the top accounts similar to the ones you're prospecting now so that you're really learning more about the actual market that the targeted buyers you're working with are fitting within? And what are some trends in that? And so we'll look at some things as like new office locations paired with the recent leadership change, like a VP of sales joining a company, which Let's us know you're considering potentially expanding and you may be considering evaluating tools because we've seen that that happens when someone's newly in a created position. And then you can couple that from a multi-layered approach with some gifts being sent with phone calls, emails, and LinkedIn connections and tracking their content. And it's just a multi-channel approach to kind of cut through the noise, especially as you're going after more medium to large businesses. The smaller kind of, you know, under 25 million, in my opinion, you can usually find your buyer pretty quickly and cut through that noise really fast. But it's the larger companies where, why are you getting the attention of a Fortune 2000 company from your outreach in that sense? Yeah. So how cool would that be if you just became a VP of sales somewhere and then you got something in the mail from you know, a company like that might be able to help you with something like that? That's, that's a pretty cool kind of trigger to, uh, to leverage. And relevance, that word is something that is being thrown around a lot um, in our industry with outbound especially. And like if you can add those relevant pieces where it's not just a random thing that someone is getting, because I think that's the mistake that at least that I've been on the receiving side of, it's it's a random gift with no thought behind it or no tie-in to something that I care about. Um, Dale, 
When you think about direct mail in terms of the contact strategy and where it kind of fits in to the contact strategy, uh, what are your thoughts on like kind of logistically, do we send something first? Do we call first? Like how does it fit into the, uh, the contact strategy? And we might have lost Dale. He looks I like, know, he's, like he's very right still now. right now. <laughs> <laughs> he's deep in thought. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> um, I'll kick that question your way, Chris. Yeah. Um, and feel free if this is the time in which you think it would be good to show examples, feel feel free to do that. But uh, like, how does it fit into like the cadence or sequence of normal touches that we might have? How do we start to think about how to combine the channels when we throw direct mail, phone, email, that sort of thing? Yeah. So uh, in my opinion, and what we see with a lot of customers, again, you want to be multi-threaded. You want to touch at different times. And so you have to come up with that series where maybe it's best to send an email first and then a gift second and then call. The the, the best thing you can do, and, and it's, it's always hard to say which is the right way. Uh, the nice thing is with most you know outbounding tools that you're using or these sales engagement platforms, you can create these you know steps and sequences and kind of test and, and, and reiterate. Um, but you can be formulaic so that everyone on the team is running the same plays. Uh, but that being said, I think one of the things that we see work well is referencing something else. Like you just sent them something and now on your cold call, be like, hey, do you like those donuts that uh, you know were, were delivered? And so it gives the, the, the seller uh, one more piece of relevant conversation topics that can warm up that call or warm up that email or uh, make it seem like it's just not a spray and pray. Um, because it's uh, because of the orchestration involved, the recipient should appreciate that you're referencing something else that took time and effort, and that should helpfully drive up the conversion and response rates. Uh, Got it. So the multi-channel piece again is it's the combination because this is the same thing I recommend with phone and, and email. It's like yeah. when I leave a voicemail, I'm going to say I just sent you an email, and the subject line is you know X Y Z. So really connecting. Uh, the channels, I think is big. Do uh, you want to just start going through a couple of examples? I think it'd be good for people to kind of see and and what we'll probably have time for just everyone in the audience. If you drop it into the Q&A, if you let us know a little bit more about what you sell and who you sell to, we'll try to come up and brainstorm some ideas for you too. I think it'd be kind of fun. So drop that into the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Perfect. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'll share my screen. Look. I got a couple of things just to show because, you know, gifting is very visual. So I'll share my screen here. And then hopefully Dale's back on because he's got some cool examples too that he wants to show. So um, I'm going to go ahead and click share here. And uh, I just tried to bring up some examples from some customers so that you could really see the examples. So this is one from Zendesk. They were sending out these movie kits, which was pretty cool because it was pretty relevant to the message of this uh, at home movie night which I think was a, a fun way to, to send something that the whole family can enjoy. Um, and, uh, you know, is a perfect personal thing when people are at home during COVID times. Um, the other thing to note here too, is just some of the, the metrics in terms of the response rates um, in case people are like, well, how, did it work actually? So all these examples were things that actually worked well. Um, and so we'll show that. Um, the next one here is from Firemon. And this was... Chris, do you mind, like, I would love to just unpack these just a little sure. further. Like, um, by the way, do do they, do your clients typically come to you with the idea or is that part of what you guys help with sometimes? A bit of both. So we will, we have a team of send creators that will brainstorm on behalf of our customers. Uh, but we oftentimes find customers have creative ideas. They just need the help executing and orchestrating behind the scenes. Um, and then there's also ways you just enable your sellers to get creative on their own. Um, which is a fun way to use our platform as well. And they can come up with ideas on what they want to send on a one-to-one -one basis or a one-to-many. Got it. So when you think about, like, just from your standpoint, and Jesse, feel free to comment too, like, um, can we talk more about the why? Like, why do you think that this was so effective? Yeah, I think in this case, again, it's uh, it, it was relevant to the audience where it's something at home that you can share with your family. So it was something that was liked by the recipients. Um, I think in this example, um, it was a, kind of a deal acceleration play. Um, and so I think that in some cases, sellers uh, um, or demand gen teams think, hey, direct mail and gifting is just a set of meeting. Actually, it can help move uh, deals through the funnel faster uh, because you're building that rapport and you're getting that buy-in. And so I think that was another way that made this work well is it was a deal acceleration play. Yeah. What's up, Dale? Dale's back. So this is a mailer that Zendesk sent out, Dale. 
during COVID an at home movie night kit. Yeah. It's pretty creative. It's very uh, cool. Next, next one is a, a series of cocktail classes. So these were virtual events that were held uh, where the, the BDR was able to send out a custom message to drive attendance. And then on the back end, they received the cocktail making kit. So it was a bit of an interactive way to have a you know, virtual event, but also have a physical component and a gift involved uh, that drove as well. Um, and so this was something that worked well. Um, and you can see here at the bottom of some of these, it's mentioning some integrations, in this case, like a sales loft, where again, if you can integrate this into a BDR's uh, sequence or cadence, you're going to likely have better usage and repeatability and uh, track the success against things. This one is fun because this is what Outreach did where they're sending out these candy hearts around Valentine's Day this year. And I think this worked well is because there's a bit of nostalgia with it. Everyone remembers, you know, back being in school, getting these like candy hearts. And so they uh, had a, a smart way to play on the nostalgia. And I think gifting uh, works well when you think about nostalgia, because, you know, you think about something that happened 5, 10, 15 years ago, you kind of like to think back on it and, and gifting can bring back those memories. This is an example of just uh, our digital gifts. So I think we're talking about a lot of gifting and direct mail being physical purely, but as a pattern disrupt, you get an email and it says, hey, here's you know lunch on us. And you get a Deliveroo, you gift if you're uh, you know out of the UK. And that's something that's a little bit different and might uh, drive your attention and, and drive your interest and response. So I think there can be digital components to, to gifting that drives the results you're looking for. Uh, this one's Gong sending out these little uh, mini pinatas, which was fun. Uh, they had a big success on this. Uh, this one I like the best here just because of the creative nature of a, a recipe for success ABM kit that Terminus sent out. And the thing that was cool about it is, is there was a bunch of multi-components to it, but they actually even created a booklet of ABM plays, but it was all geared around like the recipes for it. And it looked like a recipe book. And again, like super creative way uh, to uh, to target uh, your customers there. And then last one here, and I'll let Dale steal some thunder and some of his ideas that he has with him. But uh, Tapalti here was sending out these DIY donut making kits. So again, fun way during COVID two times or in, during these times now where people are at home a lot with their family. What, what better way to give a gift that then your kids will enjoy with some DIY donut making kits? So. Hopefully these are some good examples, Jason. They're, They're so thoughtful. We, yeah, we could have spent five or 10 minutes. Just oh, I've got hundreds more of these too. We could have spent um, hours. <laughs> before we kick it over, uh, Dale, just to some examples for you, I want to talk about there are some principles that were leveraged there. And you said nostalgia. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like a really big focus around experiences too. So yep. is this something the prospect can kind of like play with or use? And I don't know, this philosophy I've always had with gifts, not necessarily in a business setting, is that the best gifts are the things that are really awesome that you would just never purchase for yourself. It's not that you can't afford them necessarily. It just might be something that you would never buy yourself. At one point in my life, that was like a nice watch. I just would never spend money. It's like, it's like, oh, cool. Like, this is something that I got that I wouldn't normally spend money on. Um, and then the other thing too, like nostalgia experiences and then and then food, having something that's like really good. What are some of the other, I'll just kind of open this up to everyone. When you think about the principles and like things that you would do to figure out what that idea, like what are some of the principles, I guess, to create something creative in your guys' minds in terms of tying the direct mailer back to something about that person, what are some other principles that you guys think about or leverage or use to find some of those ideas? Yeah, I'd, I'd say one of the areas is the note, that message that comes along with the gift can provide a lot of uh, power. And so I think tying back the gift to the business value proposition too, um, like the recipe for success with the ABM plays, it's not, that's relevant to the service offering and relevant to solve the pain of the buyer. And so it's just not some random thing. Hey, here's some, here's some XYZ, you know? Um, so if you are trying to tie it into relevant messaging, I think that can work better. And it all depends. There, you, you can use gifting and direct mail at different stages of the cycle. Maybe you the, the customer just signed up and closed the deal and you want to send them a thank you. Like that maybe is just purely to build rapport because you know that person might buy again in the future and you want to build rapport as a salesperson. So 
Um, I think it's knowing the situation of why you're sending and what the goal or outcome is, it is equally important too. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I think that's so critical. To get back to the value prop. Yeah, go ahead, Jesse. Even, even looking at those case studies, right? And like those examples, right? Like I receive a ton of emails of people saying, hey, can I get a demo? You know, can I offer you a demo? Here's $50 to take a demo. But I have no idea what their value prop is. We may or may not be actually looking at any tools like that at the moment, right? Just getting an idea on first what your company may do, how you might be able to provide some value before we get a gift sent. I think the spray and pray from a gift approach is not as efficient as kind of the thoughtfulness that went into that, you know, recipe book, which is really creative. Um, so I just, that, like being on the buying end and receiving some of it, as well as the selling end of it, I think it's really interesting just to be a lot more thoughtful. So I'd add in, you know, on top of what Chris was saying, just relevance in your gifts to some extent on those people, which wouldn't take a lot of homework or even a quick prep in relation to why that business or why that targeted buyer might, you know, like or feel more inclined to take a meeting with you based on what you send. Love it. I think it's yeah, all about reframing the way that you think about the person that you're sending stuff to in the first place, just as an added bonus to the conversation. If I say, for example, I seek to serve this person instead of calling them a target, I think deeper about things that would accommodate the communication that I want to have with them. And I put them at the forefront of everything that I'm doing. Salespeople that are truly out there in the 1% are servant leaders. They're not elite sales warriors. They're people that empathetically can go to market and help somebody understand that they get it. Ultimately, like I get it. Sales calls suck. That's our favorite at the rebellion. You hate getting them. So we're giving you an experience instead. And ultimately, if you have no desire to get to know us further, that's totally fine because we just want you to have a good experience. It's about reputation building. It's about such a bigger perspective of what it is that you're that you're doing. I love what everybody's saying. I just wanted to add that kind of like cherry to the top. Love it. Well, Dale, let's kick it over to you, man. You got some, uh, got some fun examples because so far... The stuff that Chris has shared is uh, it's uh, like these gifts. It's it's stuff that's not cheap, but <laughs> in most cases, <laughs> um, yeah. And, uh, and and then so there's like that version of creative and like tying it back and doing that sort of stuff. And then you kind of have a different spin on really. It's like the, it's the same side, uh, a different side of the same coin. So how do you kind of think about it? And, and feel free to just you know kind of go through examples and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks, Daniela. Shout out to my baby on the way in April. It's a boy, if you didn't see. Uh, that's a, That was a creative thing that we did. My wife, she goes, I'm going to pull a Dale on the announcement. She gives my mom a box and puts an eggplant in it <laughs> and hands it to her. I, I laugh pretty hard at that, but that could just be me. So anyway, the the I love what you just said there, Jason. A lot of things we saw, super ingenious, very creative. There's two things I want sellers to think about that are on this call, like as additionally to this like high level creative concepts, uh, you can scale these things. I just want to say that they don't have to be like one offs. So they don't have to be this one project, right? You can scale this type of concept as well, too, um, and make it very affordable. So when I first started this, this whole process, just to take it back for people that don't know the copier warrior uh, AK Dale Dupree. Uh, I literally created a personal brand around this identity of how do I be different in the space? I saw a couple of copier people in here, by the way, when they were, people were shouting out what they do. So what's up, y'all? The fellow OG here in the building with y'all. So the thought was, okay, so everybody walks in the front door, gets on the phone, sends an email and says pretty much the exact same thing. Well, how do I give somebody an experience that they desire to have around a cold call? So the thought process for me, when we look at all these creative things is how do we accommodate other people and help them to see things through their own lens with our experience instead of forcing things or making someone say, well, they bought me lunch, so I got to take an appointment. No, sh no hate on that. Right. But the big picture for me was like, I don't have the money for that shit. Like that's literally what I had to say to myself. Right. I was like, I don't have 50 bucks to go buy these people lunch. And then I started thinking, yo, what about the people that have 200 employees that I want to get into? Like, I can't do anything with these people if I'm, if I'm running in that, that mindset. So I'm just going to give everybody just a quick 
view of a couple of envelopes here sitting in front of me. Uh, one of them has a big coffee stain in the middle of it. And one of them looks like the paper was all crumpled up. And most of the time, like that's how it feels as well, too. And so we created a sequence letter campaign. Some rebels have up to five or six different letters in their sequencing, uh, but all of them utilize it as a sequence. So my favorite thing about creativity is when we can nuance creativity through a sequence campaign that gives people an experience week in, week out, month in, month out. Because listen, anybody that's saying that's out there saying, because it is not this panel, right? I already know that. But anybody that's out there saying like, just send a gift and you'll get an appointment every time. They're nuts. They're yeah. absolutely nuts. As a matter of fact, a great story about these letter campaigns is that one of the best rebels that ever come through the system, his name's Jeremiah Griffin. Check him out if you're not following him on LinkedIn. He shares some awesome ideas of things he does real time as a seller. Jeremiah made a phone call after about five literal letters to somebody and about three months, four months into his system of prospecting this person. And the homie picks up the phone and says, man, I'm really grateful that you like kept this, continued this, and then also tried to stay in touch with me because I'd never call you. I don't have the time. I don't have, I just don't, I can't do that. If I did that, I'd be breaking my own rules, right? No matter how good this outreach is. So let's make perspective here around this whole concept as well too. But what's great about that is when we think about for just a second, five letters sent to somebody, what's that cost, right? The envelopes, 50 cents. The letters themselves, maybe a, a buck, right? In total, after you've gone to the store, done everything, right? Unless you got a home printer as well too. Shout out to my home printers out there, right? So the idea of the letter campaign is this concept of how do I instill curiosity? How do I sequence and nurture those I seek to serve? How do I earn the right to sit in front of them and not just bribe them into submission, essentially? So when I start with that perspective, then the other pieces of the puzzle can play in a lot more effectively because you're sharing your heart in the way that you're, you're prospecting people. It's Griffin, G-R-I-F-F-I-N for Jenny Rich, Jeremiah Griffin. The other side of this, y'all, is that you got to think bigger from the perspective of, of how you sequence things. By the way, this is, I just want you to show, to show you this from a creative standpoint. So this is a, a, a homie over Experian, uh, which is a credit report company, for those of y'all that don't know, on the B2B side of it. You see how this letter is all crumpled up, right? You see that old lady on there? And, and y'all know this, this gif. It's been 84 years, right? And the whole talking point is, is a pain point, right? So we use things like GIFs. And here's the pain point itself. Creative copy, I think, is one of the most, literally one of the most uh, underutilized pieces. So when we send somebody something super creative, the copy that goes along with it is powerful. I'll just read this to you guys. So essentially, the, the rep asks, are you having these issues that we can tackle together? It says, ensuring all your suppliers maintain required insurance mm -hmm. coverage and limits is harder than convincing Tom Brady to retire from football. Your DSO is rising faster than the numbers on my dad's bathroom scale after he discovered Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And last but not least, your onboarding and credit extension process takes a little too long, followed by this gif. It's been 84 years. So again, like sometimes, sometimes relevance is important too. Like there's not a lot of people that are going to see that gif and be like, oh, I know that gif, but the message is there, right? And that's what it's all about. So also think about the concept of like somebody writes you back, right? You, you're with Terminus, you send the, the ingredients for ABM. Someone sends you an email, goes, yo, I'd love to, to meet with you. Then And then they miss the webinar, right? Creativity never stops. And this concept of giving people experiences has to nuance. So imagine that you send a framed picture of a missing you know, person from the webinar, right? Like, hey, this, this person missed the webinar. They're missing. We haven't we haven't been able to find them. And this is a literal VP of sales. This is something Jeremiah Griffin has actually sent. This is his handiwork. Uh, he framed this and sent this over to the office so that they would get it to this person, right? And a fantastic approach, right? Because it, it pushes the limits a little bit because like a missing person is not a joke, right? But when you say you're missing this person from a webinar they were supposed to attend, it makes it so freaking fantastic, right? So it's, it's small nuances and accommodation theory, which is psychology 101 of how do people want to be a, 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 a spoken to and how do they, how, what is conversation that, that, Hits a good medium, right? It hits a plane is the concept instead of like pushing the envelope so much that you've got to like ask yourself, should I morally respond to this person in the process as well too? So for all the, the, the copier people out here as well, and anybody selling a tangible product, this is an old school copier warrior trick. This is a brick. 
It's a foam brick. So I used to send these to all the end users of, of equipment at an office. So I'd say, hey, it's it sucks when the copier breaks, right? Well, this is the magic repair brick. And I had an instruction manual that came with it that looked like a literal comic strip. And it basically, it's super outrageous, right? It's like, stand this far away and wind your right arm or throwing arm up and like say a chant and then like chuck it as hard as you can. And it's like, nothing will be fixed, but you'll feel better. And that's all that matters. And, and the reason I bring this one up in particular is to tell everybody what you got to remember is that people buy based on emotion. They will never remember what you sold, but they will remember how you made them feel a hundred percent. So when you fix problems, you have to start from this perspective of emotion and how to get people to believe that you fix problems in the first place. So tying people and having them gravitate toward you and this aura that you're building, this reputation that you're you're working uh, for yourself, you know, to be able to very, not from the perspective of like creating smoke and mirrors, right? I want to be very poignant about that because it's easy to basically say, this is who I am and copy other people's stuff. So the ideas you've seen here today, even I would encourage you to take them and make them your own. Right. And that's what we do with the rebellion. And it's that whole concept of like, everybody has their own. A great example of that is this. I've shared the letter campaign with y'all. We had a, a rep that decided to become a ninja. This is going to be hard to see, but I'll just tell you, you can find it on TikTok, okay? But what you're looking at is a sushi box. As soon as it like comes into play here, and the sushi box has like a literal fortune cookie in it. It's got a letter in it and they call it the sushi letter. And it's, it's extremely themed toward this idea that this guy is a ninja, like a real life ninja, but like for real, he's got a black belt and martial arts and all this other stuff. But he, so he created something that he's really good at. Right. And then the language he speaks and he basically like fights and beats up your problems and, and then does things like invite you for sushi lunches by like sending themed boxes of sushi of to go Chinese to go boxes right to people. And it gives them an experience that's just like it's elevated, y'all beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's elevated. And that's the bigger picture perspective. Creativity, in essence, is the idea of experiences and accommodation theory. How do we accommodate the language of people, the love language of our buyers, the thought process? How do we have fun? How do we make things fun again? They're way too serious these days. Y'all need to stop that, cut it out. It's no fun, okay? And then ultimately, how do we use that accommodation theory throughout the process as well too? So remember earlier when I said that it's not that hard to be creative, and we kind of talked about that, Jason, that everybody has a creative bone in their body. I got the crumpled letter idea from talking to a real estate guy down in Miami, Florida, when I was in Orlando. And this guy said, listen, I was sending out these letters. I was getting a 1%, less than 1% return on these letters. And so what I did is I went to the direct mail office and I, I for hours, I took a red Sharpie and I wrote, don't throw me away again on the original letter that he was sending out round two. Yeah. And then he literally smushed them and unsmushed them and stuck them in the mail. And so now somebody gets this envelope from this guy and it says, don't throw me away again, right when they get it. And they go, what? And opened it up. And so I took that theme and said, hey, look, 90% of the, the sales and marketing you get is garbage. So I pre-crumpled this letter to make it easier for you to throw away because I value your time. And that for a CEO is like genius. This, this young man, genius. Even though it's the dumbest thing I ever did in my life. Right. And I started writing more deals than I ever could imagine. And ultimately, I built relationships on unbreakable bonds where I don't even sell copiers anymore. I haven't for three years and people still call me, text me and email me and go, how can I get a copier from you still? Is that possible? Is it a way to do that? That's reputation building 101, right, everybody? So I don't know if there's any questions that, that come around the whole idea of sequencing and making things affordable, but hopefully I've been able to give a little bit of that side of things. Like these foam bricks is an example, y'all. They're $1.25 for these. So if you sell a tangible product, you can write up a fun little, you know, using Fiverr or whatever, write up a fun little like instruction manual on how to use it on the product that you fix, stick them in the mail. You spent less than three bucks. Woo. Love it. We got to cool you off, dude. You know, <laughs> Jeez. Um, I, I love there's just like, oh man, there's like what we just saw was like, two different approaches and there's so much in the middle between what Chris and, and Dale you shared. Um, what I would like to do, we got about 13 ish minutes uh, or so uh, Dale, you had to, you got disconnected this time. I think it'd be cool for us to like kind of brainstorm some ideas for some of the folks in the audience and just kind of open it up. Uh, before we do that, Jesse, Chris, Dale, any kind of parting thoughts outside we, 
uh, uh, before we start to get you know kind of creative here and help some other folks, any other like really important things you feel like we missed or didn't discuss? I would just double down on on Dale's uh, you know preaching of having fun with sales. You know, it's it, oftentimes you feel like you got to be overly professional, and and oftentimes that's what everyone else does. So everyone else is boring, and so the pattern disrupt goes back to being creative and kind of wonky and quirky and coming up with something unique. So I urge everyone on this call to like, you know, do something that you would have thought like is a little different than what you did yesterday and like maybe a little weird, uh, but like that's what's going to get a response. So have fun with it. Yeah. And I think just highlighting relationships too, right? Like sales is such a development business of people, right? And so as you're developing these relationships and you're just staying with it, you know, on top of it, different sequences, different touch points. I mean, that's over time will really lead to a lot more results. So. Yes. Love it. I would, I would okay. tell you, you, you folks to be rebellious that it, anytime like something pops into your head and you say to yourself, I can't do that. That's too much money. Listen, I, I made $27,000 after taxes when I kicked off these campaigns back in 2009 and said, I will not live in mediocrity anymore. I will not be a slave to the system. I will not be shackled to a low income lifestyle. I am called for something greater. I believed in myself and I put the work and effort in to just make this happen for myself. And, and a couple of years later, I had more money than I knew what to do with. And I was sending things like six foot cardboard cutouts of myself, stabbing copy machines with swords, stuff you never thought that you could do if you were in my shoes at that time, because it was too costly, too expensive. No way you'll be able to do that, bro. I said no to those things and made it happen. So be a rebel, get out there and do it. Uh, Mark Knight works for a company called OpenDoc. It is a doc scheduling tool to help streamline warehouses. So Mark, maybe let us know in the chat too, what's a typical persona for you? And when you think about, again, OpenDoc is the name of the company. It's a doc scheduling tool to help streamline warehouses. If you guys were starting to kind of get the creative yeah, yeah, juices, yeah. what are some of the stuff you would start thinking about? What do you fix? Yeah. Bro, what do you fix? Like, what does your product fix? What do people desire to do business for you because of, right? What's the thing behind the scenes that like, if you could be a fly on the wall, you would listen to it. So I think it was Chris earlier, or maybe it was actually, it was Jesse talked about like acumen, essentially like business acumen, like understanding verticals really well. Like you, you have to understand first and foremost, like what do you fix for people? What would they not tell you? People say all the time, they're like, get your prospect on the phone and be like, what's the top 10 problems you have? Like, they're not going to tell you that. That's dumb if they would tell you, like, you got to hear like over a beer sitting next to them and they don't even know you're there. That's the, that is when you really hear the problems, like seek that type of feedback from people. But ultimately, like, what do you fix? Like, if you can just tell us what you fix, we can work on it a little bit right here, right now. Uh, there's the, the website. So Katie, kind of interesting supply chain issues, send chains, something that's got to do with the chain. I mean, it's a little on the nose, but like, I like where like where your head's at. Another thing that comes to mind for me too with scheduling is um, if there was some sort of, you know, back in the day, one of my first like adult jobs was working in a mill where we had timesheets. You know, so if you had some sort of play on a timesheet or any other kind of play on like a calendar or a calendar that would be full, like if you printed out on a piece of paper, you had a, an example calendar and like a lot of the bullshit that that person might have to deal with, like on that calendar, um, that could be kind of a really cheap thing, you know, to do. Jesse, Chris, anything else kind of come to this is we're, we're putting our guests yeah. like on the, by the way, we, we, I didn't tell these guys we were going to do this beforehand. Uh, I, we love live stuff. I mean, yeah. I think let's run with the calendar. Like that's a great idea. Let's like run with the calendar. Like, why don't you find like in your business, like find like not just like two things. One is like I've had people do the calendar stuff, right, where they find out what's the person's interests. And so January, February, March is like someone's interest and it has something to do with the month, right? Like a football team or a vacation, right? But if you let's just say that the interests were like in January, we want like no fault in the warehouse is like something that we want as warehouse managers. And so there's like a picture of like Dwight or Michael Scott driving the forklift into the freaking, you know, like supply room and knocking everything over. And it's like no fault, you know, January or whatever. Like I like the calendar idea. I think you could run with that heavily. And you could also have someone design the days where there's like, like where a week has a ton of access through it. And you just put a little note on it. And it's like, I can't mentally handle this week because 
I just can't. So don't, don't schedule anything for me. Don't do anything. And like, if you thought like the person, if you gave again, like this perspective of like how somebody might feel that's in their shoes, that's having their problems. I, I think the calendar idea is a fantastic one. I got, I got three ideas for you. So one is like a, a stopwatch because you're probably a scenario where there's like two FedEx trucks sitting out in the dock and you can kind of be like, play on words, like how count how many minutes you're wasting. And maybe the stopwatch things kind of, uh, kind of plays into that. Um, I love the meme ideas. Um, and I think those can be printable or in digital. And like to Dale's point, there's maybe some meme. I remember months ago on like forklift, forklift certified and all this like forklift stuff. So there's maybe something you could tie to the forklift memes that were going around for a while. And then my last one is maybe like a little remote control, like semi truck car, which could be uh, tied to uh, kind of a fun gift that's related. I think back to the old school Hess trucks when I think of stuff like that, you know, like those old school Hess trucks, like people would collect and everything. So, but yeah. Dude, it, it, whoever, uh, I forgot who the person asked. You're going to do a ton of free ideas here. <laughs> a lot of great ideas in the chat too. It's, it's cool to see. There's just some creative folks here. Um, let's do a couple other ones. Uh, Brandon Weissenberger, scholarship management software to colleges, universities, and foundations, mainly selling to financial aid and advancement and donor relations professionals. So scholarship management software to colleges, universities, and foundations. What do we think? I think first understanding who you're targeting at those universities is a big thing, right? I mean, if you're going after like a head of admissions or, you know, on the head of financial side of things, that would differ a ton than, you know, more on the kind of teacher level in that side of things. Um, any thoughts on who you're targeting at the actual places? It sounds like financial aid in advancement. Oh, or, sorry. sorry, aid and then advancement donor relations. So for this one, this was a little bit easy for me just because we work with a lot of people that sell into universities and I did it for so long as well too, selling equipment and software. Uh, so think of all the things that are very common. And there was some conversation about this earlier when I was being a jerk and talking to McKinsey. And, and the thought process is, it's like diplomas, right? Or or like the scholarship itself, like the the actual acceptance letters, Right. Imagine like the financial person getting an acceptance letter. Like, what the F is this? Like there's so. So if you do something very familiar to where, because here's the thing that we didn't talk about familiarity, key components to, to the identity of how psychology plays into a conversation. Familiarity actually creates relevance because it's something someone knows and they're comfortable with. So now what's happening is very relevant to them because they go, what is this? I need to understand it better. So the things that that particular department would see and or just like in general higher education, like maybe you send you start with a diploma and then you send the cap and like you don't send the tassel and then the tassel comes separately. And and all this stuff can be themed with like coloration, things that the prospect likes. Um, and don't put your real quick, just like, don't put your logo on any of this stuff. Anybody listening? Like when you do this stuff, like don't put your logo on it. Like maybe if you have a place to like sign off on a letterhead, that's great. But like things that people might keep, right. Make it something that like is all about them, put their name on it, put their picture on it, put their logo on it. Cause people will keep that as opposed to like your Tumblr mug with your logo on it. It's like, I got 10,000 of these. I don't even want this. Right. Like I just give it to an employee instead. So, but I think if you create a familiar moment through this idea of like, stuff that they get, you know, maybe even like if we're getting a little risky and ballsy, you could think about the idea of like a financial audit <laughs> and like getting an audit essentially. But again, it's like, it's a, again, it, you got to tie that into what you fix no matter what, or else it's a gimmick. You don't want to send gimmicks. You got to tie this all into this message of what you fix and how you can do things better for people. I got, I got three ideas for you. So the first one is uh, what looks like a text excuse me, it looks like a textbook, but it really opens up and is a video mailer with some students talking about scholarships and try to hit home with that. Again, there's no, not a big, might cost much, but it's not a big monetary gift. And so oftentimes it's, it's easy to send to universities. The next is leveraging like uh, Square has like a whole list of hundreds of thousands of local e-gift options you could send. And you could find a coffee shop that's a couple blocks away from campus and say, hey, here's coffee on me to this local coffee shop right next to campus which might bring some relevancy. And then the third is uh, prop money. You know, you can buy some prop money on, on Amazon and it can be related to the scholarship and show up with a 
you know, stack of like, you know, 500, 500, $100 bills that uh, look super real and, you know, money's going to catch someone's eye. Yeah, I love that. The localization of the gift is big. Like I live in kind of near Portland, Oregon. And if someone sent me something for uh, voodoo donuts is a really big kind of popular thing to get here, that would immediately grab my attention. If you sent uh, Dale, hopefully I'm not giving away too much. You have another one of the things with sending an empty pizza box or donut box. If someone sent me an empty box of voodoo donuts, um, that would totally, I'd be like, okay, you got me. That's super clever. You know what I mean? Um Brandon, there you go. Uh, we got two or three minutes left. There's uh, like two kind of logistical things I think that are important for people. Um, one person had a question. God, I can't find it. But the question was, it was a good one. It was budget wise, are reps paying for the stuff out of pocket? Uh, are teams providing the budget for this? And I think a hidden kind of question underneath there is if I'm a rep and my company is not paying for this, should I be doing it and paying for it out of pocket? I think is probably a more direct question that this person has. Yes. What do we think? Yeah. Yeah. It's worth the investment. So, so I can speak to kind of both sides. Like back when I was a seller, so I was a sales and account executive before being a CEO and founder of Sendoso. I was doing a lot of these things, paying for it out of my, out of my own personal pocket. I then saw so, uh, enough success where I was like, hey, VP, here's the success I'm having. Can I get budget for me? And other people should be doing this too. And that was then approved thereafter based on like showing a couple examples of success. And then the best case scenario is when a company buys a, a sending platform like Sedosa, where then you're allocated, you know, thousands of dollars a month and you just have, you know, money to spend and you have the system and operations in front of you. So I think that's like the creme de la creme, but you don't need it. You can do it on your own. So uh, go do it. I think in most of these scenarios, it's pretty straightforward to prove out the ROI too, once you're able to generate some stuff moving along from you, from your, your outcome. So um, that helps, you know, get one new deal off of kind of a gift strategy, then, you know, pay for your next gifts for the next six months in that sense. So. Yep. And I don't think I'm speaking out of, out of line here and saying that I think most of the people on this webinar could probably afford a dollar fifty per prospect. Uh, between postage and a mailer. I think most of us watching this could probably afford to do that, you know? So um, don't let cost be a limiting factor. We got to run here in like 30 seconds. You guys, this was awesome. Uh, thank you everyone for just the engagement. This is super cool. Uh, make sure to check out Aller. Uh, they sponsored the webinar today. So make sure to go check out their stuff. And real quick, we'll just kind of rattle off. Uh, Jesse, where's the best place for people to go to connect with you or Aller if they want to learn more? Yeah, LinkedIn, Owler.com. We have a free version that we recommend any, you know, anyone sales account management to sign up for, kind of track a couple of companies that matter for you, track the market where you kind of sell within and help give you a little bit of edge as you're going into kind of the day-to-day -day sales. Chris, where can people go to check you out? Check Sendosa out. Yeah, find me on LinkedIn um, or shoot me an email, Chris at Sendosa.com or check out Sendosa.com. Old move there. He gave his email out to a bunch of salespeople. Uh, Dale. <laughs> What about you? Where can people go to connect with you and learn more about what you do? Head to LinkedIn right now. Either search Dale Dupree or LinkedIn.com backslash I am backslash copier warrior. I just posted uh, a literal idea for anybody out there that wants to learn the unwritten story um, uh, contact marketing piece that the rebellion puts out. I, I literally just posted it so y'all can have access to it and use that to go prospect your next big win. Oh, cool. All right. Thank you, Jesse, Chris, Dale. You guys are awesome. Thank you, everyone else, for the engagement. And uh, that's all we got for you. Have a good rest of your week. See ya. We'll see ya. Later.